What's up everybody, Steve DeCasa here with another DeCasa Film tutorial. And this time, I'm at the YouTube space. This is awesome, I got a chance to unlock the space and use it, and if you wanna do that too for your YouTube channel, go check it out. I'm in New York City, there's one in Los Angeles, there's one in like Tokyo, London, something like that, go check it out, it's awesome. So anyway, this is gonna be part two of my Filmmaking 101 series, The Light Meter. And it's the one thing I didn't talk about in my big tutorial, my 50 minute long tutorial that I put up about a year and a half ago, uh, DSLR basic settings. If you have never touched a camera before and you're looking to learn photography or videography, go check that out. I'll annotate to it right here in this little corner. So check it out. I'm going to be using terminology from that video in this video. So if you haven't seen it and if you're looking to start fresh and for some reason you've found this video first, go to that one learn about photography and videography, learn about shutter speed, f-stop, ISO, depth of field, and then come right back here. I'll wait for you, and then we'll talk about the light meter. So welcome back. <laughs> so this is part two of my Filmmaking 101 series, the light meter. So because I'm in the YouTube space, I have access to different types of equipment, uh, so I just, I'll just tell you what I'm shooting on. So right here, that camera right there, if you want to look from this angle, that's a C100 with a 2470. Two, the second one. Um, I'm shooting this camera right here, it's the only one you can't see, uh, on the 5D Mark II with a 1635 28. And then right here, the demonstration camera is going to be the 70D. Now, I never used this camera before, but the uh, YouTube space had it, and I plugged it in, I looked it up, and I really like uh, the display that it has. Now, I've lost control on the back of the monitor here. Uh, when you plug into an HDMI and you go out to a monitor, you lose uh, the control on the back. So that kind of sucks, but um, it's great for what I'm trying to talk about here. So basically what you're seeing here is what would be on the back of the LCD screen right here on the back of the camera. So since you should know from watching the DSLR basic settings tutorial, here are some settings right here. Um, it's a little bit different from the 5D Mark II from that video. Right here is the shutter speed, which is at 180 degrees right now because I'm shooting at 24 frames per second. You should know what that means. Um, here's the f-stop, we're at f8. And here's the ISO, we're at ISO 320 for the demonstration purposes right now. Now I didn't mention in that video what the light meter is and where the light meter is. This big thing right here. On the Mark II it's in a different spot, but that's the light meter. It's these weird dots and weird numbers and things. So I'm going to talk about it. A lot of people watched my DSLR basic settings tutorial and they commented on it and said it was the best tutorial that they ever saw, that it was well explained and all that stuff. And I have to say thank you so much for that. I'm so happy that it's getting through the people and that it's clear and that people are understanding it. And yet, the whole time that video has been up, I've been sort of upset that I never talked about the light meter. So I can imagine some of you out there getting a camera for the first time, watching that tutorial and going on taking a picture. Maybe something like this. Oh, look, there's something cool I want to take a picture of. You turn on the camera and you're looking at the back of the LCD screen. You're seeing this. And you zoom in and you go, hmm, okay, that's a little dark. Let me do this here. Okay, yeah, okay, that looks good. Oh, maybe I should change the ISO, still not bright enough. Um, yeah, that looks good. Okay, let me just make sure it's in focus. And boom, we take the photo, right? Let's take a look at it. There it is. There's the photo. Now, you were using the LCD screen to find what your exposure is. Um, you were using the brightness of the, the screen itself to tell you what the brightness of the shot should be. That's what you do. That's, it, it's, it seems pretty obvious, you know? It seems like, well, duh, of course. I'm looking at the back of the screen. It looks like it's the right exposure, so I'm going to take the shot. Now. Granted, with a photo, you can get away with it because photos have a lot more data in them and you have a lot more recovery in post. For video guys, they know you cannot use the LCD screen to tell you what your exposure is. Why? Well, the screen itself has its own brightness. You can turn the brightness up or down. I can turn the brightness of this monitor all the way up. Now it's at 100. Now if I were to do the same thing, Now it looks a little, now it looks too bright. So now I'm going to bring it down and then take the photo there. 
but what's the real exposure? How can I tell the difference between the inherent brightness of the monitor and what the actual exposure of the image that I'm seeing, the light that's bouncing off of it and coming to the camera? How can I tell the difference between what the LCD is showing me and what is really actually properly exposed according to the camera, according to the sensor? That's where the light meter comes in. Or how about this? What about if you have a camera that doesn't have an LCD screen on it? What if you have a film camera? Film cameras don't have a fancy little box on the back to show you what the exposure is. The first camera I ever learned photography on was a 35 millimeter film camera. So this, having an LCD screen is like amazing because you can see it right there. You can see what the exposure is. Now, that's true. For the new generation, you don't really need to know about the light meter. And that's why I didn't put it in my last tutorial. You can get away with not having to learn about it because we're so spoiled with having LCD screens. But if you really want to take this seriously, especially if you're a videographer, you have to learn about how to get exposure using the camera's instruments to tell you what that exposure is. Now on a film camera, the light meter was inside the viewfinder and it's also up here in this little zone looks like a calculator now the really old film cameras don't even have this calculators display here this um crap what is this called i'm just going to call it a digital readout um the really old film cameras don't have that the light meter is inside the viewfinder and it's magnified so that you can you can actually see it when you look through now it is awesome that I'm in a space like this, but it does kind of suck because I'm going to be talking about situations that photographers come up against in real life situations outside, you know, landscapes or, you know, wedding photographers or something where you don't have control over the lights like I do in here. So I actually had to set up a white paper over here and I just shined a pretty bright light on it. Now let me tell you how this light meter thing works. So right now I'm just going to fill up the frame with the very bright part of the seamless paper there. Now, how do you get your exposure? You come back to this beautiful light meter right here. So, in the photography world, when something's too bright, it means there was too much light getting exposed to the film, too much light getting exposed to the sensor. Or some people prefer to say it, too much of the sensor being exposed to light. Too much of light being exposed to the sensor, too much of the sensor being exposed to light. I don't care, it means the same thing. You can say it both ways. So, when something is very bright, it is overexposed. The word over comes with a plus sign, which is why we have the plus sign over here. When something's too dark, not enough light has gone and hit the sensor or hit the film. So it is underexposed. It's not bright enough, it's under. And that's why there's a little minus symbol over here. So we have underexposure and overexposure. This little guy in the middle, I don't know what it's called. It looks pretty cool. It's like a little compass needle. This little guy in the middle tells you that that's properly exposed. Now, on DSLR cameras, when you go to take a picture, you can just hit the shutter button and take a photo. But you also can press the shutter button down halfway. You just press it a little bit. Now, notice what happened. Things changed. It's kind of sucks to for as, a, as a first example, but I'll go with it. Right now, this little arrow came up. Now, you can see the shot's white, very bright. And this is on the overside, overexposed. So it's telling us that it's so bright that it's off the chart. So right now I can see my ISO is pretty high. So I'm going to take a reading again, and I'm going to put the ISO down. So let's go. By the way, I love the way on the 7DD the ISO looks. That's pretty cool. And it has all the increments of one-third stops. So that's cool. 400. Next one's five. Four, six, four. Uh, that's really cool. I really like the design. It's one of the reasons why I chose to make the 7DD the uh, demonstration camera here. So let's pop down to um, let's pop down to 320. Now the only thing that sucks about that is that you can't see the light meter changing uh, as you go. But hey, look! Now we've got a little block right here. So it's telling us that we're three stops overexposed. Now, if you saw the DSLR basic settings tutorial, you know what over, you know what stops are. So Three stops. All right. Well, let's just let's put the f-stop up to the full stop at eight. So we're about three stops overexposed. So we're going to have to iris down three stops or shutter up to the equivalent of three stops 
or a combination of both. So let's do a combination of both. So we're at F8. Let's go up one stop, one, two, three, to F11. And then let's compensate with some shutter speed. So let's go one, two, three, and then an extra pop up there. So notice when you make a click on the shutter speed, it's moving one of these little dots. Boom, one click is one dot. Boom, one click is one dot. Click, click. Every one of these dots here corresponds to a third of a stop. So if we go to overall exposure right here and we click up, one third of a stop, click up, one third of a stop, click up, that's your full stop. That's why there's a one. If we go one, two, three, now we're at two. Now, when, you're, when you press the shutter button down halfway, the sensor, the camera is giving you an active live feed. So notice, if I were to hold the shutter button down, it's getting that active reading, and I were to move the camera away, look what's happening. The thing's popping down, active, live. So it's reading that data right now. It's reading it on the fly. So if a you're, if you're at, the, at a window or something and somebody walks in front of the window or a car rolls up, a truck rolls up and blocks your shot, your, ex, your exposure is going to change on the fly and you should be aware of that and find out what now the new exposure is. That's the crazy thing about shooting in real life outdoors in you know, natural situations is that exposures can change on the fly. A cloud can go in front of the sun and cover the whole landscape in overcast. That's totally going to change your f-stop. That's totally going to change your exposure setting. So if we keep it in the bright spot, make sure I'm zoomed all the way into the bright spot. It's telling us right now that at 125 shutter, at f11, at 320 ISO, this is a perfect exposure, a perfect overall exposure. It's telling you the proper reading of light for a proper exposure overall. Just imagine this being a beautiful landscape um, we're at the top of a big hill looking down at, at uh, the Shire. There's rolling hills and trees. Can you see it? It's beautiful. And we're taking our reading and mm, there it is. 125, F11, and three, ISO 320. That's going to be a beautiful, look how beautiful that looks. So let's, let's take that photo. That's going to be a great shot. You may have noticed if you're really keen and you're really astute, you may have noticed if you were at a wedding or something or if you've watched a photographer work, you may have noticed him you know, maybe walk into a new situation. He's just inside taking photos inside, walks outside. He doesn't pick up the camera, take a photo, look at the back of the LCD screen, change a setting, take a photo, look at the back of the LCD screen. He's not doing that. He walks outside into a new situation. He's looking at his little digital readout and he's going -na 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 -na, and he's getting that, he's getting that thing right at where it needs to be. Boom. And look, I just did something quickly on the fly. I went down to F5 and 640 shutter. And it's same. It's a, still a good exposure. Look how fast I, I did that when I'm not even thinking. So you might be in a situation where just a moment ago you were at f4 and 4,000 shutter. You you walk into a new zone. You look down. You go, oh, it's, I need some more light. Let me just pop up. And you go, oh, okay, that works. Or you say to yourself, you know what? I really want to do a uh, deep focus. I don't want to do um, shallow focus. So let me pop up the shutter. Sp the, let me pop up the f-stop all the way as high as it'll go. And uh, all right, I got to go pretty low on the shoulder. Let me bunt up my ISO. Uh, let me see here. And there, boom. Now you can instantly, we got a super deep focus and a proper exposure. There was no dicking around. So that's it, huh? We're done, right? Nope. Let me hit you with another situation. Let's say you just went to Vegas. Your hotel room is beautiful. You've got a great balcony. It looks great. It's a very bright day outside. You stand out on the balcony. Hey, let me get a picture of you. You and the whole scenery behind you on your 30th floor or whatever. So let's take a look at it. See our beautiful view right here? Look, that's our, look at our balconies right here. And this all in the background is the, 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 uh, em the Empire State Building from the New York City Casino. There's the, the Eiffel Tower right there, uh, that pyramid thing, the Luxor, the Cosmopolitan Building. It's beautiful. Look at all that. Now let me go step onto the balcony. Hey, don't I look gorgeous? Now, you're going to come up against the situation. The background, this beautiful landscape, is very bright. It's noon and you're in Vegas. It's very bright out there. So before I stepped into the frame, we got our exposure. I mean, take a look at it. Without Brenda in the shot, it's perfectly exposed. Brenda steps in. What do we do? This is where being a photographer can suck sometimes. Now, a moment like this, 
a flash would be awesome. A, you know, a, a thing you put on your camera that goes poof, gives you a big burst of light. I'm sure you've seen a flash go off. Now, most cameras that we have, our cell phones and stuff, have them built in. Um, some DSLRs have them built in. The 70D has one built in. It's right here. Now, the 5D Mark II, the 5D Mark III do not have flashes built in. You'd have to buy an extra one. And they can be $500, $600. You can get a really cheap one for like maybe a $150 or something. But let's say you, you're a brand new photographer, amateur photographer, you got a camera that you went for the 5D and it doesn't have a flash built in and now you're in this situation. And that's where being a photographer can suck sometimes when you get into a situation like this. So you have to ask yourself this question, what do I want to expose for? Sometimes you're going to be in situations where there's very high contrast. Now what does that mean? It means exactly that. One thing in the frame is going to be dark because there's no light on it. And the other thing in the frame is going to be very bright. There's a lot of light on it. And the difference in stops is very big. So in this situation, you have to ask yourself, what do I want to expose for? Let's say Brenda's wearing a really nice dress. Forget about the background. It's there. But let's, I want to see Brenda's face. I want to see the clothes that she's wearing. So what do we do in this situation? Now, a cool trick that I like to do, I'm going to bring in a stunt double. Now, a cool trick that I like to do is, when I'm in a situation like this is, now I'm on a tripod, so I'm going to have to take it off. Watch the monitor here. I like to literally walk right up to my subject. I, I like to walk right up to my subject, zoom in on them so I'm filling the whole frame with the part I want to ex expose for. Now, I press the shutter button down halfway to get my reading. And I notice that I have to do some settings. So it's good enough for me. That's a proper exposure right there. So let me pop back. And now let me focus. So now I know that her face will be properly exposed. Now that block of wood might be the same amount of light bouncing off it as my skin. So let me hop in there and see what it looks like. Not bad. Not bad. At least we can see details. We can see the clothes. So here we go, set the exposure, and now we got a pretty good photo. It's not silhouetted like it was before. So it means that you have to decide what you want to expose for. Imagine a landscape. Don't you just love my drawing? So imagine this beautiful landscape, trees, details and things that you want to see. The sun's here, the sun's in front of you, so everything's kind of getting backlit, and the sky is very bright. You aim your camera at this scene and you get a overall perfect reading. Here's the likely thing that's going to happen. The sky is going to be exposed perfectly, but the ground is not. So you have to ask yourself, what do you want to expose for? If you do want to expose for the sky, I would say tilt your camera up, fill the frame with the sky, get your overall reading, come back down to where you want to be, take the photo, and it'll be a cool silhouetted thing, depending on the lighting situation of the sky. Contrasting that, tilt the camera down, get rid of the sky altogether, get the camera to be about here, get your reading for right in the middle for the overall reading, then get it back up to where you want to be, take the photo, the ground will be exposed beautifully, the sky might be a little overexposed, but maybe you can work that out in post. A week later, you get back from Vegas, you're taking a look at the photo, and you bring it into Photoshop, and you can mess with it in post. The bright spots in the back, you do some recovery, you mess with levels, you learn a little bit about Photoshop. You, could, you might be able to bring back a lot of that detail in the background. Um, even though you're exposing for the foreground, the, you're exposing for Brenda, do some work to it, and you can get a better dynamic range is what they call that. When the overexposed parts can come down and get more into the ex properly exposed level and the subject maybe was a little bit too dark but you can then bring them up. So you'll notice that a high dynamic range photo tends to look flat because it's taking the really bright ones and pulling them towards the middle and taking the really dark things and pulling them towards the middle. Some people don't like high dynamic range. They look a little too weird, a little too flat. Some people are into high dynamic range. So it really just depends on your taste and your style. You do, however, have a better chance of recovering those brights if you shoot in RAW rather than shooting in JPEG. So most photographers shoot RAW all the time, especially if you're a professional photographer. If you shoot something like this scenario in a JPEG, it's compressing it in the camera. 
yeah, your file size is going to be like 5 megabytes as opposed to a raw photo, which is going to be like 25 megabytes. So per card, per memory card, you're going to have a lot less shots per day. You know, you put in a 16 gigabyte card, you're going to get, I don't know, 500 photos with raw, whereas with JPEG, you're going to get 2,000 photos. So you got to ask yourself, what's the purpose of what you're doing? But like I said, if you're in a situation like that and you know in post, I'm going to fiddle with it to try to get the exposure look good overall, you definitely want to shoot in raw so that it, there's no compression and you can really go in there and dial in your exposure after the fact. I moved my stunt double in here for another example. Now some people I know are going to be asking about video cameras. Now I said in my DSLR basic settings tutorial that everything in the tutorial will work for any camera you have. And I mentioned that to my photographer friends and my videographer friends. The light meter, not necessarily the case. Another reason why I left it out of that tutorial. Video cameras and DSLR cameras have different ways to show you how to get your exposure. The DSLRs have the light meter with this beautiful thing. Now, as far as I know, video cameras, maybe they do have it if you can turn it on, but for the most part, you get your exposure with video cameras by using your zebras. What are zebras? Well, they're stripes. They're stripes. Now, I set this up and I have this camera set up right here to show you my monitor. This is going to be weird in meta. Now, I, don't, I, I tend to do my tutorials unscripted. I sort of go off the f cuff and I go live and I just see where the things take me. So I didn't know I was going to do this, otherwise I would have probably set this up in a different way. But since we're here, since we're doing it, uh, let's switch over to this camera here. Got my monitor right here so I can see myself. So the C100, this is a C500. Did I mention before that it was a C100? It's a C500, whatever. So let me turn on the zebras for you. Boom. There they are. So once again, let me show you them off. Notice here there's nothing, here there's nothing. Turn them on, these things pop up now. Now what are the zebras? Basically, zebras are telling you parts of the frame that are exposed, overexposed, as opposed to underexposed. Now zebras are different from the other light meter over here. Whereas this light meter tells you an overall exposure. It takes every part of the frame, uh, mixes it together, gives you an average, and then tells you where that average is. You can see the average doesn't really work for a situation with Brenda because it's the background's so bright that that is overruling the average. Now that's where zebras can come in handy because it's telling you exactly what part of the frame is exposed uh, correctly and exposed over. Now you can set your zebras to different exposure levels. Right now I have these set to 70%. Now that means you'll start to see zebras, you'll start to see the stripes at 70% of full out, full blown out, basically all the way to peaking of in terms of hotness, exposure level. So check it out. I'll mess with the aperture right here. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, you can see it right here. We're at f9. Now if I dial up, see I'm changing the f-stop. Now basically it's so blown out that you don't even see the zebras anymore. But so let me go too dark. So here we are. Now we're underexposed. Now you can see except for the very brightest part of the frame here, you don't see any zebras. You know what, really quickly, I'm going to turn off the numbers and stuff. Hang on. So I turned off the numbers except for zebras. Now you'll see, when I'm stopped down really, really low, I'm at F18. Now let's pretend that that YouTube box is Brenda. It's her face. It's our subject. It's a thing we want to expose for. This guy right here. So let's pop up the exposure level. And I'm looking here. I'm looking to find what our exposure is here. So I'm going to go a little bit brighter. I'm going to go one third of a stop at a time. OK, boom. So at f11, we got nothing. At f10, we've got zebras. And we know that it's about 70% of blown out. Now if we keep going, it's even more. And it, now that's way too, that's over. That's too much. We'll keep it about here. That's the safe place to keep it. If this is, if this is Brenda's face, a little bit of zebras on the face should be okay. Then again, in this situation, I'm actually exposing for myself, so I'm going to hop in the frame real quick and I'm going to take a look at myself. This is how I actually set up. 
and uh, I'm noticing that F9 is a little bit better. So F10, F10, I mean, this is not what I was set at before. This is totally acceptable, but I prefer just a little bit. You can see on, the, you can see on this camera that there's not really any zebras except for the super bright spots at the top of the head from the backlight. But let me go to F9, part I had it set at before. Take a look at that. Yep, ever so slightly on my nose and a little bit more on my head, but I like this exposure just a little bit better. You can also notice, looking at the monitor, that the board behind me, which I have not really used as much as the other tutorial, now you can see that's uh, blowing out. Oh, wow, that's cool. Look at that. But once again, you have to ask yourself, what are you exposing for? I want to expose for faces. Usually in the video world, you're exposing for faces. It's also really important to have your exposure dead on with a video camera because for the most part there's less to work with in post. A camera on RAW, one frame, one single frame is a 20 megabyte file. Now if that were the case with every video camera, this footage would be uncompressed and RAW would be gigabytes, thinking about hundreds of gigabytes just to do a few minutes. So every video camera, one of the other reasons why video cameras are very expensive is because there's a lot of thought put into the processing power and the compression that happens on the fly. It's why the cameras also get very hot because it's doing lots of processing, literally mathematical equations to figure out the best way to compress it. Taking parts of the image that are static and throwing them away and taking other parts of the things that aren't static in movement and making sure that that's in there and having the best quality image. With video cameras it's all about compression. So. That's great in terms of ease of post-production because there isn't hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes worth of footage to go through and have to deal with and store. But the con to that is that we have less latitude to work with in post. A situation with Brenda where the background's extremely bright and the subject is very dark, for a photographer, not too much of a problem. Shoot it in RAW, work with it in post, and you'll be okay. For a videographer using these kinds of cameras, shooting in HD and 1080, um, it's going to be difficult. You really need to get some light on them. You got to get a reflector, bounce some light back into them. You need to find some lights. Now, a flash isn't going to work because a flash is only one shot. You're going to need some continuous lighting. Another reason why videography is, a, is harder than photography, in my humble opinion. Now, there are other cameras out there, like the RED, that shoot in RAW, which you're dealing with hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes worth of footage. Uh, but the great thing about those cameras that shoot in RAW is that you have excellent capabilities in post to do an amazing color grade and make it look really great in post. Cody and my film that we shot called The Homeless, which is going to be up online uh, in July. I'll link to it here when it's up. Uh, we shot that on the red Scarlet in RAW and Cody spent a month color grading it every scene, taking his time and going in there and taking the greens and pulling them up and taking the the other colors and bringing them down and doing a lot of stuff for every single scene. As a cinematographer, that's nice because if something's a little over, something's a little under, eh, we're shooting in RAW, we can fix it later. But with a video camera, knowing your exposure and knowing how to use your camera's light meter and zebras is essential. Now, in the cinematography world, there are actually other ways to get your exposure as well. Uh, in the photography and DSLR world as well. So, one other way is to use a histogram. On a DSLR, if you hit the info button, a bunch of other settings come up. I mean, I could go through them, picture style, Kelvin, temperature, recording format, blah, blah, blah. Hit info again. Here's your histogram. I admit I do not use histograms very often. So what I know, I know from just learning from other photographers I've talked to. But the basic gist of it is at this end of the spectrum are your blacks, and at this end of the spectrum are your whites. So what you're seeing here is a live view of the picture. So basically it's complete black here, complete white here, and then here's zero amount and 100% amount. What this part of the histogram represents over here is basically pure black. Now how much of this screen is pure black? None of it is, except for maybe this area here, but even that, that's not even pure black. So, as represented on the histogram, there's nothing there. Um, whereas, contrastingly, a lot of the frame is white. And because I'm exposed for the thing here, I'm exposed for the, the Apple box, not only is most of the frame white, but most of the frame is white and overexposed, like too bright, 100%. Uh, if this was a video, it'd be really hard to bring that back. If this was a raw picture, it's still gonna be tough. 
So you can see that over here, the very, very white pixels are, there's 100% of them right there. If I were to move around, you could see changes. So what's peaking off the charts here is it's somewhere around, um, I would say like 70% gray. There's a lot of that in the frame. Now, if I were to actually tilt up to the ceiling where it's completely dark, now you can see there's nothing elsewhere except for right here. So histogram is a way to tell what your exposure levels are. For me, it's more about just knowing what's all white and what's all black. For me, I don't use histograms very often. Histogram might not actually be a way to tell you what your like overall exposure is, but at least it can tell you without a doubt if something is blown out or if something's way too dark. It's just a great way to see, you know, what really the sensor is intaking when you're reading this shot. There's another way to tell exposure that you get access to using the reds, using special monitors or using something like the uh, Ninja Blade or the Shogun or sort of external monitors that are also recorders. And that's called false color. I can go into depth talking about false color. I love using false color, but I don't have access to it right now, right here in the YouTube space. So I'm gonna skip it for now, but maybe it could be something that we can talk about in a future video. I'm sure there are a bunch of other ways to tell what your exposure is, but the last one I'm gonna talk about is actually using a light meter. Now, I did a review of the Lumu light meter. You can check it out right here if you click here. But I'll give you a warning. When I reviewed that light meter, only the photo app was available at the time. Now the video app is out. So I should do another review of that with the video app because I actually love it. Now, to be honest, I forgot it today. And it's actually a good thing, I think, because it forced me to use other ways to tell exposure, which helped me out in this tutorial. So I'll just have to talk about the theory of it. If you check out the review right here, you'll see what the light meter is. It's a little white hemisphere that you hold in places and it tells you the light. The great thing about that kind of light meter is that it's very specific. You set your frame rate, 24 frames a second. You set your ISO, you tell it what ISO you're at and you tell it what shutter speed you're at. You walk over to your subject I'm walking over to Brenda again. You take the reading and it will tell you what f-stop you're at, which is awesome. Now you might have the question, if you have false color, if you have zebras, if you have this beautiful light meter, why even use a light meter? Or I'll call it a spot meter, because that's what you're doing. You're putting it on spots. Correct me if that's wrong, but I think those little handheld light meters can be referred to as spot meters. I'm not too sure. What I love about those spot meters, those light meters, is that um, if I have two contrasting areas, for instance, here and here, I love taking my light meter, walking up to a spot, putting in my frame rate, ISO, all that stuff, and I put it right here, and I go, oh wow, okay, so at, at 24 uh, frames per second at um, 320 ISO, this is an F11. Then I go over here and go, ooh, okay, this is an F4. How many stops is that? Four, 5.6, eight, that's three stops, right? Four, one, two, three, one, two, three, two, three. Yeah, boom, nailed it. So that would tell me that that's three whole stops difference between the two. Where that comes in handy as well is you get to know your cameras. Some cameras, especially like the older DSLRs, like the 7D and the 5D Mark II, they don't like it when things are that far apart, contrastingly. They like, if you're going for a, a contrasty look, one stop is good enough. Otherwise, the camera just can't see that side at all. Cameras are getting better, but Cameras do not see as well as our eyes do. And you're gonna learn that right off the bat when you're taking photos. I can see with my eyes the differences between here and here. I'm looking at it with my own eyes. I can see all the details in both. You turn a camera on it, it's one or the other. You're either gonna see details in the exposed, the, the bright area, or you're gonna see details in the dark area. You gotta pick one. That's one conundrum of being a photographer or videographer is that our eyes see better, in a way. Our eyes have much better contrast range, dynamic range, than cameras do. So knowing that, if you walk up and take a reading, and it's three stops difference, might want to try and even it out a little bit more. Try to make it only a stop difference, depending on the camera. If we're shooting the red in RAW, three stops ain't so bad. And a lot of times when you read about cameras, you'll hear, oh, this has 15 stops of dynamic range. That's true, but I mean, it's scary. Do you really want the bright thing to be 10 stops brighter than the other thing, that's a little crazy for me. I think it's more just in the raw, you have a lot to work with, you can make things very dynamic in post, but I wouldn't rely heavily on 
15 stops of dynamic range. Well, that's about it, guys. So I think just as a quick closing statement, the light meter, I didn't do it in the first one because you can get by without it. But now that you know a little bit more about it, you've taken another step towards learning about this art form and being able to do what you want to do more efficiently and a little bit faster. And remember, it all comes back to your style. Now that you know a little bit more about how to use the light meter and choosing what you want to expose for, you have another trick up your sleeve and another tool in your toolbox that you can use to achieve your vision. Thank you so much for watching. What do you think should be next in my Filmmaking 101 series? What's the next thing that should be the next step on your way to becoming a master photographer or videographer? Let me know in the comments below. I'll check them out and I'll decide which should be next in my Filmmaking 101 series. I don't just do tutorials here. I do product reviews, question and answers, and coming soon, I have ideas to do an interview show with friends, cohorts, colleagues, and just people that I think have a really good insight into the filmmaking career. So stay tuned for that. And also now that I have the YouTube space unlocked, I'm gonna be trying to put out videos at least once a month, maybe twice a month. So please subscribe if you haven't already. I'm just about to hit 40,000 subscribers. So thank you so much. And as always, happy filmmaking. Peace.